How's it going guys? My name is Graham and welcome to Two Left Thumbs. This is actually a video I made nearly two years ago. It was originally uploaded on the Let's Play channel because this one didn't exist. I've recently decided to start moving a bunch of those videos over here so they all exist in one location. I really wish I could transfer it with all the views and comments and everything over here. Unfortunately, YouTube just doesn't allow that. I'll leave that video unlisted on the other channels so we're not losing that legacy content. I have made some slight corrections throughout the video and expanded on a few things that have developed in the two years since. It was also a fun opportunity for me to correct a few visual things, as well as making it so you can actually hear the background music. I already did four videos covering two hours worth of content on this game, and yet there's still more to talk about. But those videos were way more about digging up cool secrets and easter eggs within the game. One thing I very intentionally steered clear of throughout those videos was theories. I've been stockpiling a list of cool fan theories or events in the game that tie to these larger ideas, but I haven't made a video digging into anything beyond the surface level yet. Here, I want to do a thorough compendium of everything related to the elusive Dr. Gaster, as well as some very deeply laid seeds that intertwine the worlds of Undertale and Deltarune. And I'll probably sprinkle in a few other relevant things as they come up. Really, Gaster isn't prevalent in Deltarune in any way. Everything that we have to go off of is based off of findings from Undertale. I know you would have heard a lot of it before, but people have been digging stuff up for years. There's probably a few things in here you haven't heard, and we can weave things around and lace it all together and link it up to Deltarune. We'd start with a little bit of Gaster's known history. W.D. Gaster was the royal scientist before Alphys, responsible for creating the core. As far as we can tell, Gaster is not present in Undertale whatsoever, but through his followers, these creepy monochrome weird that hang out around the world, we learn that something went wrong with one of his experiments, and now his whereabouts and location are unknown. There is a hidden value within each save of Undertale that is a fun value. You can't control it or affect it without editing game files, but it allows for certain random events when playing, like finding secret rooms. One of these rooms contains this creepy figure that the game files refer to as Mystery Man. He's a stationary figure with a skull-like face and no proper hitbox, you can walk straight through him. When you interact with Mystery Man, he becomes surprised and flees. One more weird thing about this character is that if you invert it, it still appears to have a proper face. Interestingly, there's events associated with all of the fun values between 61 and 66, with the exception of 64. The fun value in the background required to find this room is 66. 6 is an important value across all of this, it heavily ties to Gaster repeatedly, right down to Gaster's own name being 6 characters long. Now while Gaster doesn't actually appear anywhere in the game, he does have unused stats with an attack and defense of 6666. Something of much more general interest, while numbers like 1 and 8 can be inverted and still look the same, 6 is the only number that can be flipped over and become a new number, similar to the way this mystery man can be flipped around and become a new version. Some important notes about Mystery Man. He is monochromatic, the same as Gaster's followers. His face has cracks on it, linking to the idea of Gaster being shattered across dimensions as described by one of his followers. His face is very skeleton-like, connecting a larger theory that Gaster created Sans and Papyrus. I have more evidence to present to tie all this together, but moving forward for all intents and purposes, we are going to treat this Mystery Man as Gaster. Some people disagree with that, some people have competing theories, but when I look at all the available evidence, this makes the most sense to me. If you disagree with that, I would love to hear how and why, because it's super cool to talk about. In a different secret area, someone points out that someone with a creepy smile is spotted behind you, but when you whip around to try and interact with them, there's nothing there. One last related room connected with these fun values is a room containing a transparent figure that is slowly revealed as you approach. Attempting to interact with this figure gives you a displayed set of Wing Ding's font characters, which when translated, only read, Redacted. Upon leaving this room, you are taken to a secret sound test room where you can listen to sounds not used elsewhere in the game. One of the files present is Gaster's theme. Upon selecting this file, you can no longer select any of the others. There is a specific sound effect, the Gaster fade sound effect. That only plays in three instances in all of Undertale, one of which was added after the game's initial release. I'll come back to that one. The first is when Mystery Man disappears when interacting with him, ergo, Mystery Go. The other one is when the head-holding Gaster follower disappears when talking to them. And eventually, after their addition, Clam Girl or Goner Clam uses the Gaster fade, which directly connects with the Mystery Man and the Gaster followers. Maybe it's a generic sound effect that randomly disappearing black and white characters use, but it seems a little too coincidental. Plus that Gaster follower literally states that he's holding a piece of Gaster. I couldn't find anywhere that officially refers to it as a Gaster fade sound effect. I'm pretty sure in game it is sound mystery go, but when it's reversed, slowed down and looped, Does become the 
Gaster theme. So yeah, sure, why not call it the Gaster Fade? Interestingly, Clam Girl is the only one we see become a follower. In every other instance, we see versions of these characters before they've turned. This one instance stands out because she changes right in front of us and then disappears. We now have a few isolated connections to draw here. That weird figure in the room by himself who speaks in wingdings is now connected to the sound test room that has the Gaster theme. The Gaster theme is now intertwined with the Gaster Fade, which directly associates with Mystery Man and one of the Gaster followers. Our web here is getting a little more complex. WD Gaster's full name is likely Wing Din Gaster, which kind of altogether becomes a combination of Wing Ding and Aster, two different fonts. There's already examples of Sans and Papyrus being named after the fonts that they use. WD Gaster could literally be Wing Ding's Gaster. There are also a few rooms that have nothing to do with the fun value and instead can only be accessed by directly editing in-game files. One of these is room 264, also in-game known as room underscore gaster. It is a black screen typing out shaky wingdings text with the terrifyingly creepy sound file now strongly associated with gaster titled muse underscore smile. The text in this room is now known as entry 17. That would be a very hefty tangent right now, so I'll be sure to give it its own attention later on in the video. Toby not being one to make use of something only once, stretching it to its full potential, this sound can actually be manipulated to recreate Muffet's laugh. I couldn't get it exactly, but the gist of it is that you have to speed it up a few times. And the way the sound is constructed is playing that laugh on its own, then reversed, then on its own, then reversed. So you need to isolate and flip those separate sections, raise the pitch some, and it takes some tinkering, but once you get the speed and pitch roughly right, then you can compare it to the actual Muffet's laugh. And while not perfect, you can tell that they are the same sound. In the time since first making this video, I've lost some confidence in this. And instead, it might just be a neat insight into approximately how this sound was created, if not precisely. That comparison just isn't as exact as it first seemed. During the Muffet battle, she actually has dialogue tying back to this whole smile thing. The person who warned us about you offered us a lot of money for your soul. They had such a sweet smile, and it's strange, but I swore I saw them in the shadows changing shape. Many have speculated it was Metaton who hired Muffet, and it does make a lot of sense. After all, they have lots of money, have hired others to hunt Frisk, and do literally change shape. After all, they're only premiering their new body later on. That doesn't mean it's the first time they've ever taken that shape. But I think all of this might still be a bit of a red herring. Creeping around in the shadows doesn't really fit their loud personality and typical MO. It's also going to be pretty difficult for one of the biggest TV personalities in this world to be discreet. Sure, later on, Metaton takes credit for hiring everyone, but they weren't actively trying to kill Frisk until after they entered the core. With this Muffet encounter taking place so much earlier, there's a good chance that whoever was creeping around in the shadows was someone else. We could either think of this character as transforming, going from Mystery Man to whatever the hell this is to the thing that this guy's holding, or we go off this idea that he's scattered across time and space, meaning that any, all, or none of these could be Gaster. So more smiling, a weird shadowy figure, the ability to transform, we have two sprites that might actually be Gaster, so maybe he's actually able to transform, assuming that we have this continued connection of smiling. Even crazy thing you can do with the smile sound file, which is just fun to say, there is actually something known as steganography. It's the practice of hiding files, messages, images, and videos and such in other instances of those media types. Now while it sounds like just a bunch of random scattered nonsense, we can open up the spectrogram and see if those frequencies were actually used to draw anything. Speedy on YouTube stretched this out, rotated it, played around with the brightness and contrast, and we seem to have this weird skeletal figure. But more than likely, this was intentionally drawn out within the sound file. Something else that I found in the time since first making this video is this direct quote from Toby. There are some people who are trying to find every secret in the game, so they put stuff into spectrograms and say, look at this guys, it looks like a smiley face, there's a message here. Literally every file you put in there is going to have a smiley face in it if it's just static noise. Some of them still believe it, like, bro, that says I've made something that makes people willing to believe I would do that, so I feel like that's credit to me. 
undercutting the point I just made, it feels like a huge buzzkill, and maybe Toby did do some of that intentionally, I hate to take that away from people, but I feel in the interest of making this video as comprehensive as possible and as accurate as possible, I needed to present both the fun sleuthing underminers have done, as well as a direct response to it from Toby themselves. Across all of this we now have the following pieces of evidence. The mystery man sprite with a cracked skeleton face and black and white coloring matching Gaster's followers. Two specific references to smiling, with the creepy smiling person that is pointed out but not seen, and the smile sound file. This muse smile can be altered to become Muffet's laugh. Muffet talks about a shadowy figure and a man with a sweet smile. As if Mystery Man's smile wasn't creepy enough, it is equally creepy when flipped upside down. This smile sound file plays in the Gaster room. This room uses Wingding's fonts. The other use of Wingding's fonts is with this hidden figure and tied to Gaster's theme. That theme then connects back directly to the Gaster fade, which Mystery Man and the Gaster followers use. I originally was going to draw lines between all of this, but in the process of attempting to do so, I was literally losing my mind trying to keep track of it all, and at the end of it I was no closer to finding out who Pepe Silva was. So instead here's just a bunch of things on the screen. I would say this on its own provides very compelling evidence that Mystery Man is Gaster. There's even more to talk about, but I'm saving it for later parts of the video, so I think this on its own is already plenty of evidence tying all of this together. I should stress here and now that Toby has never confirmed any of this. He, he likes to just spectate, take a step back, and watch people run wild with their detective work. There's an official set of Undertale tarot cards. This got really exciting because one of them featured Mystery Man as Gaster. But my understanding of this is that it's something that Dog Bomber did and it was later adapted into being official Undertale merch. And at the time that that was done, a few minor changes were made, including Toby telling him specifically to get rid of the Gaster one. So briefly, it seemed like we were getting the closest thing to confirmation we were ever going to have, and it was taken away, leaving us all to speculate like absolute lunatics. When going back and forth with the river person, they have a few random clips of dialogue to share, one of them warning you, beware the man who speaks in hands. Pretty cryptic overall, but we can start to infer that maybe he's referring to Wingdings. There's nothing directly linking this to the larger theories of Gaster, Gaster's just a seemingly powerful being, and this is the most literal interpretation of talking in hands that we have. Even though it's not confirmed, it all seems to make sense. Well, I mean, it makes enough sense. Essentially, none of this is present in the regular game. It all required thorough sleuthing, snooping, and rifling around in game files to find this stuff. It leaves a mountain of unanswered questions upon the release of Undertale, as well as a thriving obsession to learn more about the history of WD and what it all means. So now the community has been left with this lavish thirst that never quite fizzled up and obviously came to a tee with the lead up to the release of Deltarune. Toby knew exactly what he was doing and fed off of that with the pre-release of this game brilliantly. Now, you can download and play the first chapter of this game for free on Deltarune.com. This was made public on Halloween 2018, October 31st, but the website had actually existed well before then. The Wayback Machine shows archived versions of websites over the years. It doesn't automatically catalog these, people have to preserve it themselves. So since this website wasn't public knowledge, it's very likely that Toby preserved these old images of it as breadcrumbs for us. The oldest available goes back to July 2017 and contains a single black image titled Him. PNG. Now while Deltarune the website was not archived further back than that, this image specifically was. You can go all the way back to December 2015, just a few short months after Undertale's release. This oldest version of it contains Wingding's text, which as we showed is mainly associated with Gaster, which reads in all capitals, this next experiment seems very, very interesting. A full year later in December 2016, a much harder to read message was deciphered as reading, three heroes appeared to banish the angels heaven. The three heroes don't really have a place in Undertale, but are very, very important to Deltarune. But the angel's heaven is rather interesting. There's a prophecy in Undertale that reads, the angel, the one who has seen the surface, they will return, and the underground will go empty. It's interesting how this works either way. You either allow the monsters to return to the surface or wipe them all out, either way leaving the underground empty. Maybe suggesting that the three heroes of Deltarune will set a new course preventing these events, or it could be that the Angel's Heaven has already been banished. It's uncertain exactly where this game takes place in the timeline. It also depends how we interpret this heaven. Is that the version where everyone lives above or where they all die below? Really, it kind of raises more questions than it answers, but it shows some really early connections between Undertale, Deltarune, and Gaster. There are even some older tweets from Toby around that time dating back to the end of December 2015, so this would have been closer to the time of the first version of him.png. The success of Undertale has been incredible, thank you to the artists, the fans, and my friends for supporting me in 2015, but lately something has left me feeling unsettled, a burning, inexplicable feeling. You could say, its very nature is shrouded in darkness. 
For a lot of people, you might start worrying about their own personal well-being and that they might be losing their grip on reality. But here, what might have caught your eye is that Toby is clearly quoting something. And interestingly, he is quoting himself from all the way back in 2013 on a Kickstarter update for Undertale, claiming that immediately after that game was finished, he would begin scripting out his next game. The other game, I can't tell you anything about it. Its very nature is shrouded in darkness. So now all of a sudden we have things dated back to 2013. Toby clearly knew he was making another game, he knew it was related to Undertale, and he knew that the Dark World was going to play a part. The original designs of Lancer, Rudin, Clover, Hathi, The King, and Jevil all come from a 2012 art project by Kano Times, who Toby credits as being a big source of inspiration for him. These creative designs were something that immediately sparked something in Toby's mind. He started building and fleshing out a world, not knowing exactly what he was going to do with it. On November 1st, 2018, after the release of Deltarune, after that 24-hour grace period, Toby released this screenshot from an old script at the beginning of May 2012, with work-in-progress dialogue for Lancer. So Toby already had these designs to go off of, he had already come up with a name, he had come up with some semblance of a story, there was a lot going on. Even though we hadn't heard of it until its release, Deltarune was in development way back then. An entire three years before Undertale's release, and six full years before Deltarune's release, Released, plans for this game were already underway. Now at length, Toby has talked about Delta Rune being something different, some sort of alternate universe, but it seems unlikely that it's an alternate universe the way that Marvel Comics does their what-if storylines. This isn't some silly playing around in the sandbox just to see what happens. These two games are intertwined to a degree that is very complex and wholly unique. Now I understand none of this itself is a theory, but it is important for setting the stage when talking about this under-ruined Delta Tale universe that we have going on. These characters, events, details, and stories are inexorably linked. I know that's a lot of time spent talking about the lead-up to the release of the game, now we can start layering in that factual timeline with more actual theory. Here I want to look at Toby and Undertale's Twitter accounts leading up to release. Things got kind of buck wild over there the day before, October 30th, making everyone's heads explode in anticipation. Toby kicked things off with a tweet that's about as cryptic as it comes. It's cold. It's as if everything has been enveloped in a black wind. You don't realize it yet, but it seems that there's someone who wants to talk to you. The black wind itself is very notable. It's the sound effect that was used at the end of Undertale's genocide run. As a side note, the black wind is also a recurring motif in Chroma Trigger. It's often seen as a magical force connected with the presence of the primary antagonist, Lavos. Coldness being enveloped in black wind, it all harkens back to Shrouded in Darkness. There's interesting ways to look at this. Is there a character within the game who wants to talk to us personally? Is a character wanting to talk to another character in the game? It's very mysterious and is something that's still not totally clear at this point. Next, I hopped over to Undertale's Twitter account where we're introduced to this someone who seemingly wants to talk to us. Welcome. You've been looking for me? How wonderful. I have been looking for you as well. I have something. Something I want to show you. Something I think you will find very, very interesting. Now, I was going to have to bring it up at some point. Here is a good place to do it. While Gaster does type in all wingdings, it is also always all uppercase. Everything being in capitals like this somewhat ties it back, but that re-usage of very, very interesting, which existed all the way back in December 2015 with that old hidden file, him.png, this next experiment seems very, very interesting. So here now we have something coming up again nearly three years later, likely an experiment, one that he finds very, very interesting. But it is not complete yet. No, it is far from complete. Thus, I have a small favor to ask of you. At that time, I will ask you a few questions. Then, using your responses, we will approach its realization. Thank you very much for your time. I will be in contact again soon. Return here in 24 hours. Here, Toby kind of breaks the illusion a little bit, just kind of briefly. For those who completed Undertale, it is really important that you check out the Twitter account 24 hours from now. I want to make something new, and it all begins with your feedback. He doesn't really reveal anything, but he does just kind of let people know that this is a real event that's happening, it's not just him going nuts on Twitter, or some sort of directionless tease. So the next day, on October 31st, we get thank you for waiting so long. After all, you and I have both been waiting such a very long time. So to be here, finally, on the verge of connection. Quickly kind of jumping forward a little bit, mentioning a chance to be connected. The whole survey program, Delta Rune, opens with Are We Connected? is quite exciting. I look forward to creating a new future with you. Now, show yourself, Delta Rune, followed by links for us to go and check out the site. The game was not immediately revealed to be called Delta Rune. There was nothing telling people that this had anything to do with Undertale. Everything just kind of said, hey, you guys might find this worth checking out. When you even downloaded the game, the EXE file was just called Survey Program. 
Then again, using the Wayback Machine, we can see the website how it first was, before it had been turned into a proper Deltarune page. Welcome, please read these final warnings, then take it in your hands. Gaster, and whoever was tweeting out through Undertale's account, has a weird, inexplicable way of putting unnecessary spaces between things to emphasize words. Very interesting and noteworthy that hand stands out as separate when Wingdings is all about talking in weird symbols and hands. And the next day, on November 1st, Toby comes back to thank us all for taking part in the project. He now says that he wants to build the larger game following Chapter 1 based on community feedback. So it may have literally been done as a survey to gauge initial responses and see how people physically played the game, what decisions they made, how they interacted with things, how fast they played through it. But by releasing it this way, it shrouds it in this larger, dark mystery of some external influencer pulling the strings of this game world. It was a very fun, very cool way to set the tone for the game before it was even released. Now, the Twitter handle for Undertale was changed into this cryptic six blank characters. Now, combined with the tone, the delivery of the messages, the all capitals, the use of very, very interesting, people obviously were starting to think that this was Gaster speaking to us. It's missing that classic WD font, and this could be because Twitter doesn't really cooperate well with Wingdings, but if that was the issue, Toby could have easily typed it out somewhere else and pasted in pictures instead. Maybe in this one instance it was meant to be public and not cryptic, otherwise it might not have generated the same generalized interest. Gaster's a pretty hidden part of the game, so people who didn't go out seeking that stuff aren't really aware of it. Using an illegible font like Wingdings might have deterred too many people from checking it out. So this could be seen from both Toby and Gaster's perspective, trying to make this survey as public and accessible as possible. Seeing as how massive the fan base of this game is, how secretive Toby can be, and how he was willing to sit on this game for years and years and years, it's likely that leaving out Wingdings here was very intentional. I said I would bring it up at some point, now is as good a time as any, I want to talk about Entry 17. You can easily find the lab in the game where Alfie's the current royal scientist conducts their experiments, but during a true pacifist route you can actually find the true lab. There's a ton of cool background stuff to be discovered here, you can learn all about Alfie's as a person, her connections to Metaton, how Flowey came to be, the amalgamates, experiments with human souls, there is a ton going on down here, and despite the fact that Gaster was the old royal scientist, there is not a lot directly linking him to this. But throughout the true lab you can find 21 separate diary entries talking about the experiments being conducted. Interestingly, the 17th is not accessible. While in fact, hidden within the game files, not accessible in normal gameplay, there are two entry 17s. One of these is presumably from Alfie's and carries on pretty similarly to how the rest of them did, but another one is found entirely in Wingdings, presumed to be written by Dr. Gaster. His own entry number 17 reads, Dark. Darker, yet darker. The darkness keeps growing. The shadow is cutting deeper. Photon readings negative. This next experiment seems very, very interesting. What do you two think? All these references to darkness, the dark, darker yet darker, and negative photons, things like that. WD might have been trying to get into the dark world, or maybe he at least became aware of it? That would feel like a stretch in most situations, but considering these games were conceived together, I think there might be something to it. Seemingly inconsequentially, the Gaster theme is 17 seconds long. As a statement on its own, that doesn't really mean anything. But in conjunction with Entry 17, it starts to become a number of recurring significance, the same as 6. This next experiment seems very, very interesting is what we saw on the Deltarune website way back in the Him PNG of 2015. Speaking of this encroaching, growing darkness makes you think of the shrouded in darkness quotes that Toby kept using. And at the end, he says, what do you two think? There's a lot of debate of who he's referring to with you two. There's a lot of theories that Sans and Papyrus were created through Gaster's experiments, so he could be talking to them. This could have been the final experiment that did Gaster in. It could also be Alfie's and an unnamed third scientist. It could be Alfie's and Sans, seeing as how Sans has his own lab and is therefore somewhat scientifically minded on his own. Based on the evidence we've gathered and the connections on hand, it's pretty safe to say that Gaster was the one talking to us through Undertale's Twitter. Now beyond these more surface level comparisons, there is more to get into here. The main one being the recurring use of him. We already have two examples of him, only one that I've actually touched on fully. The first of which is those old Deltarune.com images titled him.png with the hidden wingdings messages. Now the second one I mentioned only indirectly, in that hidden sound test room where you can listen to Gaster's theme. There are four songs you can listen to, Meat Factory, Happy Town, Trouble Dingle, and Gaster's theme. All of them have unique string references in the game files to be called up. They are all muse underscore st underscore and then the name of the song itself. The one exception is that Gaster's theme is not underscore Gaster's theme, it is underscore him. After the short Gaster's theme slash him track plays, we get the message, thanks for your feedback, be seeing you soon. 
all of this I then link back to that thread we see on Twitter. We have this glimpse of this omniscient survey giver in the Undertale world. W.D. Gaster was a scientist, we can assume that experiments are being conducted by him all the time. Toby started all of that by saying, someone wants to see you. Now, a leitmotif is a recurrent theme throughout a musical or literary composition associated with a particular person, idea, or situation. If you want the best possible description of leitmotifs and how they're used, I recommend Nerdwriter's video on Howard Shore's score of Lord of the Rings. It is a very interesting watch, especially if you love Lord of the Rings, but I think it's a great video no matter what, and really explains what I'm getting at here better than I could probably ever hope to. This is something Undertale already made really heavy use of, so it's not surprising that Deltarune would do the same. To give you a nice digestible example of this, we'll look at Land answer as a character. He has his own particular theme, and events, locations, and characters that heavily connect to Lancer also share those light motifs. It's important to keep in mind that the light motif doesn't actually need to use the same instruments. It doesn't even have to be the same pacing. It's easy to miss if you're not looking for it, but it's kind of a cool wink and a nod when you know to look for it. Undertale and Delta Rune being two great examples of where to find it. We're just looking for that repeating musical phrase. Lancer's theme is nice and jazzy and standout, so it's a little easier to pick up on. I'm Very Bad is quite distorted. It's menacing, it's not anywhere near as upbeat. When fighting Lancer, there's this driving percussion behind it, changing the feel pretty dramatically and getting you kind of hyped up in the process. One more silly example is the elevator style music, which plays during the thrash machine menu. Sounds like something you would hear in a polka center. It's so wildly dramatically changed here that it's one of the easiest ones to miss. This also appears in Card Castle and Chaos King, but I'll leave you guys to look that up for yourself. There's a lot of really cool videos online of people showing all of these off. Pretty damn cool overall, hey? It's been a fun little aside, let's get back to the larger point here. Now the sound file that we were introduced to as Gaster's theme, also underscore him, is a leitmotif that is used twice within Deltarune. Most notably, the very first song we hear in the entire game during the survey portion is titled Another Hymn. The amount of layering that we get here with the use of him, this particular sound file, the use of experiments, this manner of speech. Hopefully this video has already connected the dots for you and now it's just driving it further and further home. The other use of the Gaster theme leitmotif is in another song called April 2012, which appears in the club's room inside Card Castle. It's a seemingly inconsequential part of the game. But the song name itself is definitely referential to how long this game has actually been in development. It's interesting because the people attending this party are Clover, Hathi, and Rudin, three of the characters who were designed way back when in 2012 by Kano Time. It seems like a fun way to just link back to how long this game has actually been in development. People have even found an old buried GitHub link that contains this song dating back to 2012. Not only does this help confirm the timeline of the planning and development of these two games rather simultaneously, but it also ties Gaster back to the very beginning of it all, with Gaster's leitmotif seemingly being present in the first piece of music from this entire series. Now it's stepping somewhat out of the Gaster theme that I've been going for here, but still tying it together in a way. I mentioned that Sans actually has his own secret lab in Undertale. In it can be found some blueprints, possibly for an experiment of his, as well as a picture with three poorly drawn smiling people on it. We've already seen weird smiles come up a few times, specifically for Gaster, and skeletons are kind of unable to do anything other than permanently smile. There are also these illegible blueprints down in Sans's shop. Now, our character has definitely read other things, they aren't illiterate, so either this is just really sloppy writing, or it's overly confusing and complicated because it's some crazy scientific stuff. But what is most likely here is that the symbols and handwriting are again linking us back to Wingdings. Similar to how Gaster was revealing this experiment to two other people, could be Sans or Gaster, Sans or Alfie's, or who knows. But written on this picture are the words, don't forget. If we're going for super large stretches, it could be Gaster and some sort of lost family. Maybe his experiments were in an effort to recreate those he lost, and he ended up with Sans and Papyrus instead. That is probably the single most speculative thing in this entire video, but I wanted to throw out the fact that we really don't know if Gaster is tied to this photo at all, and in either instance of this photo and the end of Entry 17, we do not know who the extra two are. Considering this little specific piece of dialogue was added in a patch after the game's release, even more likely is that it's our three heroes from Deltarune, possibly further evidence that Sans has been jumping around in time and space. 
continuing on with that topic of leitmotifs. And this leitmotif occurs throughout the entire game. The credit song in Deltarune is titled Don't Forget. I'm not going to go through every single example, but it shows up in the game a lot more than any other leitmotif in the entire game, making this a pretty impactful, seemingly sentimental connection between the two worlds. Following along with Sans, how he connects to Gaster and how that operates within this world, in Undertale we see these odd glowing flames coming out from under his bedroom door. It's definitely odd at the time, but there's nothing to be inferred from it. But now in Deltarune, we start to see the same thing happening in doors that act as teleporters. Sans is very interestingly the only character that is visually the same in both games. He doesn't have any sort of redesign or updated appearance. He also appears to be the only one who's aware of both worlds. I mean, that is a pretty big wink, but he might just be razzing us the way he's known to do. But if we do assume this is the same Sans, it's pretty likely that some of his experiments back in Undertale had to do with traveling between alternate universes. If Gaster really is shattered across time and space like his followers suggest, and he is connected to Sans through these experiments, as he's strongly appears to be. Sans has a book on quantum physics, he has his own workshop, he apparently has a history with Alfie's, a clear affinity for science, we even get some hints at some unknown anomaly with timelines that he's studying, to the point that he's actually aware of save functions. During the Sans battle, he has these skull-like laser guns. They kind of remind me a bit of the Determination Extractor. In the game files, these sprites are Gaster Blaster, so while not addressed particularly directly, there is a lot in there connecting these two. Sans might be on some sort of unseen quest to track down the pieces of Dr. Gaster across alternate universes. There is a lot of evidence to feed off of here. Things that began in Undertale and are layered on much more heavily in Deltarune might actually warrant a video of itself because it goes pretty deep. During our vessel creation sequence at the beginning, a lot of the files in the back end are titled as Goner Maker. Here we are making a grayscale creation similar to the followers. Goner Maker might be a reference to Goner Kid, who appears to be the follower version of Monster Kid. This is the only example where we have a proper name for one of the followers. There's some theories that this kid is maybe something a little bit different, but it takes some digging so it makes more sense to just loop them with the followers. There is a pretty cool tease in-game. When we ignore Monster Kid and allow them to slip and fall, Undyne saves them down below. Undyne, you saved me! Yo, I thought I was a goner! As well as literally falling, we seemingly have this layered in arc of Monster Kid falling into the darkness of becoming a goner. It's a lot to unpack, so for now we'll lump in Goner Kid with the other followers. It's something that seemingly needs more evidence than we currently have. So while we have these narrative through lines and these more vague connections that bridge these Delta Tail worlds more broadly through Gaster, from music to the use of him to the use of a font, there are a few more, much more on the nose connections that I want to rattle off. Attempting to name the fallen human Gaster in Undertale will cause the game to return to the intro. Similarly, trying to name the vessel in Deltarune Gaster resets the game. The vessel and the fallen human are both the characters that we play as within the game. Deltarune goes a step further by letting you name the creator. If you name the creator Gaster, the game entirely shuts down. We've already talked about some of the other connections to the number 6. Gaster is 6 characters long, the fun value of 66, but if you look at the properties of the exe file for Deltarune, it is version number 666. Calling back to the idea of talking in hands given to us by the river person, this is more than likely referring to Wingdings. We saw on that original Deltarune landing page, the word hands was kind of separated out. And something in Deltarune that I've been trying to find meaning in and might be reaching a little far here is that all the hands and all the clocks in the school don't match each other and seemingly don't match real time, with one of them actually pointing at 6.30, which is not how clocks actually operate. The hour hand would be halfway between the 6 and the 7. So instead what we have is two hands actually pointing at the 6. Now I found a post about this over on Reddit, going all the way back in the original demo of Undertale, kind of before people realized how deep-seated some of this stuff was going to be and how much digging through the files was going to be required. File 0 is the default save file for this game, and before you've actually started it, before you've named your fallen hero, it defaults to Gaster. I tried to recreate it for myself and I didn't really have any luck. It could just be that I have the wrong file version, maybe the guy who shared this was totally full of it, but if it is true, it's another really cool example of that scattered across time and space. Cell phones are broken in both games. If you try to use one when you're near any of the Gaster followers in Undertale, the phone will not work. If you try and use the phone anywhere underground in Deltarune, it similarly won't work, but will also play the very creepy smile file that we found in Undertale.
There is the whole wrong number song event where someone calls you and cuts themselves off when they're about to say a name that starts with G. I wasn't even going to include this. There's nothing else here that really connects that to Gasser. Just kind of a really silly event overall. It is tied to your fun value, which I guess is special. But other than that G, there's not a lot else to speak about. I simply threw it in because I know it's a common thing that people are likely to bring up otherwise. The Gasser followers show up in both games. One of which oddly doesn't have a counterpart in Undertale. But we now get to see them in Deltarune? It's kind of strange. Both of the shopkeepers we encounter in the game, both Sham and Rule's card, share a lot of visual similarities with Mystery Man. After defeating Jevil, Sham even has some extra dialogue directly quoting Dark, Darker, Yet Darker from Entry 17. There's something fishy going on with this cat. I would speak my mind and be a little more honest about it, but after all, it's rude to talk about someone who's listening. Arguably the most infamous secret from Deltarune is our mysterious person here who's hiding behind the tree. We really don't have anything to go off of here. The only real connections are the layout and simplicity of this room and the fact that the man disappears rather quickly. It's been kind of commonly accepted in the fan community that this is Gaster, and I so badly want for that to be true. Before he goes, he does give us an egg. Why? It's hard to say. It doesn't really tie into anything from Undertale. But similar to Gaster, it does seem to be an egg out of time and space. It's also the only individual item that persists when returning back to the overworld. Everything else from the Dark World gets compressed into a little ball. When you try to drop the egg, it disappears saying, what egg? Well, this is also a reference to wet pumpkin. It does seem to be a weird thing that just kind of comes and goes. You can put the egg inside Asgore's fridge, which for some reason suddenly has two eggs. If you say no to getting the egg, it says, then there is no man. And he's gone all the same. Something interesting that underminers found over on Reddit. When you interact with an object in the game, it checks several variables to tell the game what strings of text to play. Now, sometimes if the game has nothing to return or is missing values, it'll crash the entire game. Not very good for bug testing. So programmers often include dummy text. Something to display if anything goes wrong while you're testing. They're quite useful and there's no reason to remove them from your code at the end of the game. And in 99.9% .9 of games, they're incredibly boring and mean nothing. Here in Delta Rune, we get quite a few hidden ones that are pretty spicy. First, is that a cut on your face or part of your eye? Seemingly referencing that mystery man sprite directly, but seeing as how rules and Sham have weird eye things, maybe it's about one of them. You can't read these symbols. Or maybe it's the handwriting. That one's just very clever, kind of multi-layered, a little on the nose. I like that one a lot. This one in particular was also eventually seen in Sans's secret lab drawers, as shown earlier. The gash weaves down as if you cry. That's just very descriptive, and again, probably the mystery man sprite. And then two more that are less on the nose. Suddenly, your body seizes up. What are you looking at? And the pain itself is reason why. One, Gaster and his followers apparently have a weird aversion to being looked at, so maybe that's a thing. But at the very beginning of the game, there was also the text of you acknowledge the possibility of pain and seizure. And the number one thing that has people absolutely losing their mind is the big red door south of town at the end of the game. There is a very quiet, very subtle sound effect being played. If you increase the volume of the sound and speed it up by, you can probably guess, 666%, again creates that smile sound effect. Seemingly the most we're ever going to get to know about Gaster is behind this door. But as of chapter 1, as of this demo, our original survey here, this is not something you can actually access. And yes, I know a few of you are going to talk about editing your position in the game files and how it teleports you to the door and it causes a jump scare and all that. I've seen that video, it was faked. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to burst that bubble. In that video, he actually even explains that he was kidding and that it was faked. But because he explains it after a big jump scare, I imagine some people maybe like panic clicked and closed their phone or closed the video. But yeah, while that does obviously very closely tie with Gaster, it is not something we can physically interact with or explore any further than that one sound effect tying it together. This area with the red door you can walk around in is titled Room Town Shelter in the Game Files. A shelter to contain something? Or a shelter from something? We really don't know. That name itself doesn't really connect to anything, but when you switch into the game's debug mode and move through each of the different parts of the game, every individual room has a unique identifying number. The room, this area that has the big red door and this creepy sound effect, is room number 17. A pretty obvious connection between all of this and entry 17. Guys, researching this was a much deeper dive than I was expecting. For the vast majority of it, I'm relying on things that people have been pulling together for years and years and years over on Wikipedia pages and what have you. It's crazy to see how deep this runs, how long it's been planned, and how little we actually still know about any of it. 
but I'm very excited to talk about it with you guys, and maybe with our collective heads we can start piecing this all together. Very quickly, I want to remind you guys of the existence of Scrabdackle, a delightful wizarding adventure being created by Jake Friend. I'm helping out with this one a little bit behind the scenes. It's a project I am thrilled to be involved in, and I can't wait for you guys to see it. The plan is to have a Kickstarter early in 2021. We don't have a precise date for that. If you want to be kept up to date, please go to scrabdackle.com and sign up for the mailing list. We promise not to email you with anything other than the Kickstarter date. I think this game is going to be really special. I'm really excited about moving these videos over to this second channel. I'm a little nervous, you know, that it won't be as popular as it was the first time around. That video had a really well-maintained level of popularity since it was first uploaded, and I hope I'm not shooting myself in the foot and gonna be victimized by the rage of YouTube's algorithm. But I trust that some of you won't mind watching it again, especially with the updates, and that it'll still be new to the vast majority of you. But if any of you guys want to do me a huge favor, please like, comment, share this video around. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm really looking forward to updating lots of these old videos. I have a lot of new insight to add. A huge thank you to patrons of the channel. There's another bonus of updating this video. You guys get some special credit this time around that didn't exist previously. Look at you paying for recycled content. I wrote that out as a joke, but when I say it now, it makes me feel like a lazy jerk. You guys may have seen a joke hidden in the top of the video about me working on a video, Sans is Sans. Back when this video was being made, that was meant to be an Easter egg. Layered in with a lot of fake things, that was a real video I was planning. And as many of you have seen, that video now exists. For people who are really into Undertale and Deltarune hidden secrets and theories, if you love this video, you're gonna love that one. I'll make sure it's in the end cards here. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.